Hello, everyone, and welcome to November's The Wellness Wednesday. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, today we have Kathy Lawrence from Power Back Rehabilitation um, talking to us about um, the benefits of exercise. And before I turn it over to Kathy here, um, I'll go ahead and let you all know. So we will have a Q&A at the end. Um, so be sure to utilize the chat box function and we'll answer those questions for you at the end of the session. Okay, and Kathy, it's all yours. All right, let me get my screen shared and get my PowerPoint going. Um, thank you guys for joining me at my presentation on the benefits of exercise for those that are diagnosed with Parkinson's. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Kathy Lawrence. I'm a physical therapist. I have 22 years of experience now. I graduated initially in 1999, um, got my master's degree, and then got my doctorate degree in 2005. I graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And really the last two years, I have started specializing in Parkinson's. I've always seen patients with neurologic conditions, but I really wanted to hone in my skills for Parkinson's. So in the last two years, um, I've done a tremendous amount of training. I am LSBT big certified. I'm Power Moves certified. Um, I'll explain what that means later. And I'm currently working for Power Back Rehab and Rehab to You. Uh, we do in-home outpatient therapy, PT, OT, and speech, and we're located in the Charlotte area. So we do the Charlotte metro area and even into South Carolina. We have a gym as well at Memory and Movement Charlotte, where we partner with the neurology team there. And I had to add a little <laughs> cute picture of my family um, on there. It was the best that I could find. <laughs> So today we're going to talk about general benefits of exercise when you have Parkinson's disease. I'm going to talk about very specific Parkinson's disease programs that you can do to improve your symptoms. We'll talk a little bit about why exercise is hard when you have Parkinson's, and then we'll just talk about how to start and how to get going. So why is exercise important? Um, I think everybody kind of knows the general answer for that, that it, exercise is important for everybody, but it's very, very, very specifically can improve Parkinson's disease symptoms. Um, this is supported by the research, which shows that people with Parkinson's disease who start to exercise a minimum of 2.5 hours a week will experience a slow decline in their quality of life. Studies have linked exercise to reduce the risk of Parkinson's and slower progression through neuroplasticity, which we'll talk a little bit about more later. And studies also show that exercise can help with non-motor symptoms like constipation, orthostatic hypotension. Uh, those things can be helped with exercise as well. Um, so establishing a good exercise habit is really essential to the overall management of this disease. So what type of exercise should you do? So most people always recommend the first four things. Um, today, I'm going to add the neuromuscular reeducation. Uh, neuromuscular exercise into the conversation, but there's aerobic strength, balance and agility, flexibility and posture. And now the fifth element, which is neuromuscular exercise. So if we're talking about aerobic exercise, we're talking about walking, jogging, hiking, any type of biking, um, and even aerobic group exercise. The key thing when you're doing your aerobic exercise, though, is that you really want to try to keep it in that moderate to vigorous intensity level. That has been shown to um, be the best when it comes to anyone who has a neurologic um, condition. So that's, if you, if you are at moderate, that's exercising at 50 to 75% of your heart rate max and vigorous is 95, 75 to 96% of your heart rate max. So strength training, this is using weights, resistance bands, using your own body weight, 
um, to get strength training. Um, it's really important though, to use the correct amount of weight. Um, so you can consult with a physical therapist or personal trainer to get started using the right weights. Cause you don't want to be too light. Um, cause you're not going to get a good benefit from that. And you don't want to be too heavy because you don't want to, um, hurt yourself by, um, using too much weight balance and agility. I included like the Tai Chi um, into this. Um, there's a lot of research going on now about Tai Chi and the benefits for specifically for um, folks who have Parkinson's, dancing, all types of dancing. Um, there's There's been a lot of research done on the tango, but any type of dancing is beneficial. Um, it really, really helps with uh, dynamic balance and agility. So doing some static ba balance, that might be just stand, trying to stand on one foot, doing some tandem standing, and then you have dynamic balance, which is like walking sideways, walking backwards, um, any type of uh, movement um, will give you that dynamic benefit, which is most impacted with those who have Parkinson's. I put flexibility and posture together because I think that when you're working one, you're kind of working the other. Um, programs for this might be yoga, Pilates, traditional stretching as well. So when you're doing flexibility and posture, you want to make sure that you're stretching those uh, gravity affected muscles. And those muscles are like your anterior chest muscles your hip flexors, the most muscles that are in, right in front of your hips and your hamstrings, uh, they all get very tight as we age and are particularly affected with those who have Parkinson's. And then you wanna go ahead and strengthen those opposite groups. So those anti-gravity muscles. So the posterior shoulder strength to offset the stretching in the front, you wanna strengthen your quads, strengthen your glutes. And that's going to give you really great flexibility and posture so that you maintain the best posture that you can. We want to try to stay as upright as possible as we age. So this is from the Parkinson's Foundation website, and it's their general guidelines for exercise. And I'm, I'm sorry, it looks a little small, um, but you can find this on the website. I put the website at the bottom corner um, so that you can um, look it up later. I can put it in the chat box as well. So you can just click on it. But these are their recommendations. Um, they recommend aerobic exercise three days a week. They recommend strength training two to three days, non-consecutive days a week. They recommend balance, agility, and multitasking two to three days per week and stretching two to three days per week. So these are just their general recommendations. And I want to make sure to share that with you. So the component that I think is missing is the neuromuscular exercise and specifically because of its impact on neuroplasticity. So at our core, humans move in a neuromuscular way meaning that we use both our nervous system and our muscular system together to make movement. Neuroplasticity is the capacity of nerve cells to adapt to certain circumstances. So those nerve cells will respond to stimulation by generating new synapses, but they also respond to deprivation and that leads to weakness. So lack of movement um, will lend those nerve cells to not function as well. A review of the research shows that there is enormous capacity of the brain to reshape itself in response to self-produced movements. And I will say focused pattern movements, um, if I were to add to that sentence, and that exercise, exercising the right way, facilitates these changes in the brain. So these are the two programs that I'm going to talk about very specifically for neuromuscular exercise. I have a couple others that I'll mention as well. Um, and I know you've probably had a lot of presentations on LSBT Big. It is the most popular. And then I'm going to talk a lot about power moves. And we're going to do some of those exercises as well. So you can get a good feel of what those exercises are like. 
So I'll start with LSBT Big. Um, I won't I won't harp on it too much because I know um, there's probably been a lot of presentations about it, but this is the most well known and most research therapy program out there. Um, it is provided by a certified clinician. It is ampli intensive amplitude based therapy. Um, it's for the note motor system and it re-educates our sensory motor system. This is a skilled therapy program that is provided one-on-one -on -one with a certified physical or occupational therapist. And this is a Medicare and insurance covered program. It goes around these fundamental principles that it is hypothesis based. Um, that it is Parkinson's disease specific, but we do use this exercise program for other neurologic conditions as well with really great results. Um, it's based off of neuroplasticity and it is research based. So this has been heavily researched in showing um, good outcomes when used with um, people who have Parkinson's. So calibration is the key component of this movement. So when we're providing this therapy, we're teaching people what normal sized movements are. And once you get through these normal sizes, you then start moving better all around. And our clients just become empowered when they're given this control over their Parkinson's. Now this program is very strict. It is four times a week for four weeks. It's 16 sessions and you do daily homework. So if you're gonna sign up for this program, LSBT Big, and you're not scheduled for four times a week for four weeks, it's not the full research-based program. So this program, it's very strict how you're supposed to um, perform it. And we always perform this as it is, is researched, which is four times a week for four weeks. People will perform seven daily exercises, five functional tasks, and one hierarchy task in every session. This program works really well with people who have Parkinson's disease when the small movements become um, the primary issue. So they're starting to shuffle with the gait, taking smaller steps, maybe freezing of gait becomes an issue. Um, arm swing is very little or non-existent at all. Um, we find that this program works very well with those symptoms. And when we see somebody for physical therapy and they present this way, this is usually the program that we will recommend for them. Now, the other program is Power Moves, PWR exclamation point moves. And this was developed by Dr. Becky Farley. She's a physical therapist. And it's with a framework that she called exercise for brain change. Um, this program is also performed by certified clinicians. You have to go through the program to do this. And this program is um, very interesting. It really addresses the four motor control skills that deteriorate and lead to loss of mobility um, and function in people who have Parkinson's. So rigidity, um, which is when um, you just get really tight and stiff. Uh, bradykinesia is when your movements become a lot slower in coordination. Um, so sometimes your arms and legs don't want to work the way they're supposed to, um, coordinating when you're walking or moving and reduce self-awareness, which um, is that sometimes those people um, with Parkinson's who maybe had a really slow progression, um, they're not really aware that their movements are slow. And this helps bring that to awareness. That's what the reduced self-awareness means. So each of the four basic power moves is designed to address these four building blocks of function. So anti-gravity extension is, um, you know, anything that keeps you upright. <laughs> um, weight shifting, which um, becomes a major issue with um, freezing of gates. So freezing a gate is really a weight shifting issue. Axial mobility is referring to that trunk, the loss of trunk rotation, and then transitions. Um, so transitions can become more difficult going from sitting to standing, um, initiation of gates, uh, getting up off the floor, bed mobility, those types of things. So these exercises can be performed seated, standing in all fours, all fours on the ground, um, 
supine is when you're on your back and prone when you're on your stomach. So each exercise can be practiced in isolation. So just one exercise, or you can combine different positions and you can also link the movements together um, to kind of mimic everyday movements, which is really um, what I think is unique about this program and why I love it so much. Um, same thing with these movements, large amplitude, high effort and attention to action to have the best quality of movement. So with this one, there's no specific protocol. Um, you can do this proto protocol as many times per week as you like. Um, and it's really just based off of the clinician's judgment and kind of, um, you know, what the patient um, is feeling as well. So sometimes people don't, they're still busy. Everyone's still busy, right? And um, you might not have time to do physical therapy four times a week for four weeks. So sometimes this is a good program for those who maybe can only do therapy twice per week. Um, and it's just as effective um, so it might take a little longer to get results doing it at a lower frequency, but we still get very, very good results. So this is kind of a glance at what all the exercises are. Um, and again, I didn't have the, the best picture for, for you, um, but... Um, so on the left hand side, you'll see the descriptions of the exercises and then they show the exercises in all of the positions and we're going to do the seated ones here in a minute, but I'll talk about each one. So the power up is that first column and you can see doing it in standing sitting on all fours prone and supine and you can see with this exercise that we're really working the posture muscles those muscles in the back of the shoulders. Um, really trying to um, have a tall and erect posture. Um, power rock addresses the weight shifting. So um, we're reaching, we're turning, we're leaning in different directions to get um, a better sense of being able to shift side to side. That exercise is really great for those who are suffering with some freezing issues. Um, power twist is addressing that trunk rotation that I spoke of. So we're really taking our trunk to the max rotation in all the positions. And then power step, this is for the transitions. So um, it's hard to tell in the pictures, but we're having big, large amplitude stepping mo movements. Um, and this is also very helpful for freezing a gait, but also helpful for um, bed mobility. So if someone is really struggling getting in and out of the bed, um, we might select these exercises for them. So we're going to go through some of the exercises. And if you're able to and want to, you can uh, do the exercises with me. Um, we're going to do them all in seated position. So if you are able, um, have a chair and we'll go through these exercises, or you can just watch me go through the exercises, but I want you to be able to see the exercises. So I'm just gonna relocate myself so that you can watch me. And like I said, if you feel safe to do, please follow along with me. Sorry, there's a little bit of a glare. This is bright, the bright sunny day. Move right here. All right. So the first exercise is the power up. So we're seated at the edge of our chair here. Our legs are wide. Our hands are on our thighs, kind of um, in this position with the hands. And we're coming down and then we're squeezing our shoulder blades. So we come down with our head, and we squeeze our shoulder blades. Now be careful not to put your head down like this and come up because you could get a little dizzy. So we always wanna keep our head up when we're doing this exercise to avoid being dizzy. But this exercise really helps with the stooped posture and the tightening that happens in the front of our chest. Okay, that was that one. This next one is one of my favorite exercises because to me it feels so good. So this is the power rock. Again, we're gonna start with our legs wide apart. 
and we're going to lean heavily to one side and on the side we're leaving that leg is still bent the other leg we're going to put out straight and i know you can't quite see me let me put it a little lower we're leaning and we're putting that leg out if you can't and you're like this that's fine as well if you can extend um, that is the best position with our free hand we're going to reach down towards our foot and we're going to look at our hand and then we're going to come up big behind us and we're going to reach down and come up big behind us and we want to try we start off slow but we want to try to make the movements faster so when we master the movement then we want to add more speed to it and then we'll just switch sides we lean the other way got to keep ourselves even and we're reaching down towards our foot and we're looking at our hand the whole time and we're reaching down and we're going to our full range of motion or whatever does not cause pain these exercises should never hurt they should feel good because you're stretching some of these muscles that really need to be stretched okay so that was power rock all right this is power twist this is working on that trunk rotation so we're gonna sit up real tall. Let me cut myself off again. Legs are wide again, sitting up really tall with our good tall posture. We start with our arms all the way out to the side. And then we're gonna swing our arm across and clasp on one side or clasp. And you'll see my leg is twisting a little bit. That's okay. And then we open back up. And we can either go to the same side or we can switch sides. And then we're clasping on this side. And then we're opening. And we start off really slow with this one because with the coordination, uh, this one can be very challenging. And you always want to look where we're grabbing. And then we want to speed it up. And a lot of times we'll use some sort of toy or instrument to get a noise so that we can see the force and the power with the exercise. Okay. And the last one is power step. So this exercise, the legs are a little bit closer together for our starting point. We are sitting at close at the edge of the chair again um, with our good tall posture initially. And I'm gonna start going to my left. We're gonna take a big step while we reach out. And then we're gonna take a big step back, kind of bow a little bit. And then we can go the other side, big step out, and then big step back. And you can see what I'm looking for is really high knee movement. And then really opening up and getting that leg out to the side. So you can think about the things in your daily life that you might struggle with because you can't lift that leg up high enough. Getting in and out of bed getting in and out of the car. This exercise really works on those types of activities and getting that really big, powerful and effortful movement. All right, those were all the exercises. I hope, I hope some of you did them with me. If not, that's okay. Let me come back over here where there's no bright lights. <laughs> All right, so power moves, like I said, um, we use with folks who maybe don't have the time for four times a week, uh, maybe the really, really high level um, 
where coordination is an issue, we like to use these exercises with, um, and, um, and really just those exercises can be uh, modified um, for any level um, of patient that we're seeing. Um, for, for someone who's more advanced with the Parkinson's or someone who is newly diagnosed. So um, that was Power Moves. Um, I wanna talk about some other very excellent programs as well. So these are some other programs, treadmill walking, pedaling for Parkinson's, rock steady boxing and yoga for Parkinson's. So treadmill walking, studies have shown that subjects who perform vigorous to high intensity treadmill exercise, which is at 80% of the heart rate max, had no changes in their motor scores, while the control group had worsening scores after six months. So what that says is that the treadmill walking at this level, they were able to maintain their current level of function without any declines. Um, so that is to me huge. Um, of course, treadmill walking can be dangerous. So treadmill walking can be performed with a light gait harness treadmill. We have one at our gym at Memory Movement and we use it for a lot of our patients. Um, when you're in that harness, you just feel safe. You know you're not gonna fall and we can put folks on a treadmill and we can really get that speed up and really get some good continuous walking because treadmill walking has also been suggested as the most effective treatment to manage freezing of gait. So there was a really interesting article that came out from the Parkinson's Foundation recently about freezing of gait treatments and treadmill walking was listed as the favorite to help with the freezing of gait. Pedaling for Parkinson's. Uh, this is riding uh, an indoor stationary bicycle has been shown to reduce Parkinson's motor symptoms by as much as 35%. And it's something that almost everybody can do uh, versus a treadmill, which you might need special equipment for. Um, almost everybody can ride a bike. Um, so for this program, participants ride indoor stationary bikes for one hour. They start with a 10 minute warm up, then a 40, and then 40 minutes at 80 to 90 um, RPMs. With, some, with whatever resistance is appropriate for them. And then they have a 10 minute cool down. So 80 to 90 RPMs is a pretty good pace. <laughs> if anybody's been on a bike, you'll know that's a really, that's a really fast pace. Um, and you can take these online and you can have live in person. And there are more than 150 facilities across the country. So if you want to join a Pedaling for Parkinson's indoor cycling group, just go to pedalingforparkinsons.org. Rock Steady Boxing, of course, everybody has heard about this program. It is the most famous, most talked about program for Parkinson's, mostly because the amount of fun that I think people have when they go to Rock Steady. So this is a non-contact Parkinson's boxing program. This program provides education and student-specific training to help people with Parkinson's improve gross motor, motor skills, balance, confidence, and also mental sharpness. Um, I have been there. They definitely challenge uh, cognition in those courses as well. Um, this is considered a high intensity exercise and endurance training that is performed through boxing. So it helps patients improve all their mobility skills, crawling, hopping, jumping, and walking. Um, there are a lot of rock study um, facilities out there. To find one near you, go to rocksteadyboxing.org. Yoga for Parkinson's. So yoga poses can target different muscle groups. Uh, sometimes strength, some strengthen the core, which helps your posture, while others work with the extremities. Um, person can modify movements to meet their needs. So these, you know, any level can do yoga, can do it in seated position as well. And these can be done in a variety of ways too, which is helpful. So if you have some up and down days, you can adjust this program um, to, for whatever you, the day is bringing you. So the Parkinson's Association of the Carolinas offers in-person and virtual yoga programs. 
The bottom line is there's no 100% right exercise program. So you can be flexible and exercise the way that you enjoy it. Um, as you can see, there's a lot to choose from. But there's a lot of challenges to exercise. So I wanna address that a little bit. Um, fear of falling is probably the biggest reason that some folks do not do any exercise. They think they're gonna fall if they exercise. Um, some folks already at this point might have a loss of strength, might have deconditioning already. That makes it harder to exercise and it's harder to exercise without assistance. Um, motivation is a challenge. Um, apathy is a part of Parkinson's. And sometimes it's hard to tell if it's the Parkinson's apathy, lack of motivation um, for exercise. Um, but once you start seeing results, the motivation comes with it. Um, and some people need somebody to help them. Um, so it's just about finding the right people. So how to start, you want to find a physical occupational therapist or even a personalized trainer that specializes in Parkinson's. You want somebody who specializes in it because there's just this higher level of understanding of what is going on head to toe when it comes to Parkinson's. When you work with somebody um, who's trained, they can adjust the exercises perfect for your abilities. They'll reduce your fear of falling because they're going to make sure that exercise is safe for you. They also um, understand non-motor symptoms um, as well as the motor symptoms, right? So it's really important for your trainer or your therapist to know, you know, that sleep sometimes is a big issue um, when you have Parkinson's um, or knowing, you know, the off times and what happens during the off times. Um, you know, and you might have some comorbidities that make exercise harder. Um, you could have a lot of osteoarthritis. Um, so exercise, you want to make sure it doesn't hurt the joints when you're doing it. So when you have a specialist, they're going to address all these areas. So if you want to find an LSBT big certified clinician, um, this is the website, the lsbtglobal.com slash LSBT find clinicians. And that will give you a list of all the local LSBT big certified therapists. If you want to find a power moves certified clinician. So those are all the, the exercises that I showed you. You can find them at um, pwr4life.org slash directory. Or you can join a Rock City Boxing class by going to rockcityboxing.org to find a location near you. I wanted to end talking a little bit about the therapy coverage and Parkinson's because this is really important for people to know this. Because um, I guarantee you, your doctor <laughs> may not know this critical information because therapists um, and the Parkinson's Association have been fighting and fighting and fighting with Medicare um, and other insurances uh, for coverage. Uh, but the Parkinson's Foundation worked with the Parkinson's community to address the Medicare challenges related to services for physical, occupational, and speech therapy since 2011. And that includes the advocacy to remove the improvement stat standard. So prior to this point, Medicare would say that in order to receive therapy, there has to be an understanding that improvement was going to occur and that progress happened during the therapy sessions. Um, of course, as you know, with any chronic progressive condition, sometimes progress is not the goal. The goal is to not decline. The goal is to stay right where you are. And sometimes that still requires skilled physical therapy, occupational or even speech therapy. So when that happened, um, people who had Parkinson's could no longer be denied coverage for therapy solely because of the lack of improvement. So in February of 2018, this exceptions process was made permanent, meaning that people in Medicare can no longer be denied therapy 
if they need it to manage their health condition. Now, of course, we have to manage this on our end and fight <laughs> with Medicare still for coverage when progress does not happen. But they, we have strong um, backing. Um, Medicare was sued. They lost the, the lawsuit for, for it. Um, they're not allowed to deny coverage. So we just have to be sure that we're explaining why it's medically necessary. So that was really great news. So when someone says, oh, your therapy is not going to be covered, um, that's not true. Therapy is covered. Um, there's no cap on therapy services. Um, now, sometimes if you have a managed care plan, we might have some therapy issues or therapy coverage issues, um, but we work through it. Um, you know, and, and folks who are still on traditional insurance, because um, you're not of Medicare age, um, there might be some limitations with visits, but we work together with the patient, whatever our patient client is, we work with their insurance and we try to get everything covered. Um, but I wanted to just really reiterate that these services are covered um, as medically necessary services, which is very exciting. So, um, any questions? Um, let me see if I can open the chat. Where else? If you have any questions, you can unmute yourself at this time. You don't have to use the chat box anymore. Is there an advantage to doing water exercise with Parkinson's? Um, that's a very, very good question. And somehow somebody is writing on my screen. It's not me. <laughs> um, I'm going to just change it. Oh, that is so interesting. Um, I don't know what, <laughs> what happened there. But anyways, um, yes, I'll address the, um, the walking and water. So. Um, doing walking in water, the second you start walking in water, it changes your gait pattern. So, um, you know, you have resistance, so you're walking against resistance. Um, it's harder to take really long steps. Um, it's harder to get that arm swing. I don't discourage water walking, but what I tell people is it cannot replace ground walking. So you have to walk with, when you have Parkinson's on the ground um, with a normalized gait pattern. Um, that is what is going to maintain your gait status is practicing normal walking on the ground. Um, so like I said, I don't discourage water walking um, or any type of water exercising. It just cannot replace your daily focused walking that you should be doing. And it looks like we have a chat, um, a question in the chat here. There we go. Um, How long James. do you recommend on the treadmill? Oh, um, so the treadmill was 30 minutes um, at that, um, the study was for the 30 minutes at that high intensity. Um, but there's a lot of conversation about walking and that it doesn't, have to be 30 minutes all at one time, that it can be broken up into different time frames. Um, but the study was 30 minutes of walking. That sounds like all walking in the green. Oh, say that again. Uh, I would you say all types, all types of walking, all types of walking are good. Is that the, the all type? All types, all types of walking are good, but your primary walking exercise is on the ground. Um, and, and there's a lot of research even outside of Parkinson's that shows to maintain your gait, um, a normalized gait pattern, it needs to be out of water. Um, but there's definitely other benefits. So some people, you know, maybe the osteoarthritis in the knees is so... Um, significant that walking on the ground is too painful. 
um, then water walking might be the only way to really get that walking in. Um, so there's always exceptions, but if you are capable of walking um, on the normal ground, that is the number one recommendation to maintain a normalized gait pattern. And did you give us any kind of uh, target or goals of minutes to walk each day? Yeah, so, the, you know, the general consensus is 30 minutes. Um, there's a lot, you know, sometimes it's, uh, you can look at steps instead of time. Um, you know, if, you, if you're if you a step counter, you wear, you know, one of the watches, you know, you're trying to get to that 4,000 step minimum, um, which roughly is around 30 minutes of walking. Um, but if you have a very slow gait, um, the steps might not be there, but then you can get the time, you can shoot for the time. Um, but 30 minutes, and it does not have to be 30 minutes at one time. So you could take a 15 minute walk in the morning and you could take a 15 minute walk in the evening. Um, the intensity of the walk is what's really important. Um, when you're walking, trying to get to that moderate level of, of exercise. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Kathy, one last question for me. Uh, yeah. Do you have any experience with atypical Parkinson's? Yeah, um, uh, we, we've, we've seen many, many a type of um, Parkinson's um, across the board and um, atypical Parkinson's um, does respond to the exercise the same way that the um, uh, traditional idiopathic Parkinson's disease does. So all these exercises are still beneficial. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, motivation. Please subject more ways to stay motivation. <laughs> You're right. Um, it it 100 is um, is it motivation's an issue for people who are disease free, <laughs> um, still trying to get out there and do your walking. Um, everybody finds a different reason for motivation um, to exercise. So, you know, a lot of times when we were younger, um, our motivation was to stay thin, you know, and not gain weight. So we were going to exercise um, or we're going to exercise so we can eat whatever we want for dinner. Um, but of course, as you age, the motivation changes. Um, staying motivated is... Um, is a, is a big challenge too when apathy is um, a, a, a symptom that is uh, coming along with um, your diagnosis of Parkinson's. Um, and overcoming that barrier even makes it harder. So a lot of times what I tell people is that exercise is the only thing that stops the progression of Parkinson's. Um, everybody goes on medication, um, and you take that pill every day. Um, but the pill is just managing your current state, um, and keeping you mobile, of course, but it's not preventing the decline. Um, exercise is the one and only thing that can prevent the decline. And you have to find motivation in, you know, what do you want your life to be like? you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the road with your Parkinson's. Um, you know, you see these really great stories of, of people who are the, the American Ninja. If anybody walks, watches the American Ninja challenge, um, there was a guy on there who had Parkinson's um, and he was still working out, even though it was a lot harder um, and you just see these really, really great stories. So Parkinson's does not limit you, um, but people self-limit when they have Parkinson's. So um, sometimes um, finding a coach, um, that's why I, I highly recommend um, either getting a physical therapist in your life or a personal trainer, um, because they're going to help with the motivation. And it's more about maybe about reminding what the motivation is. 
Um, hopefully motivation comes with results. Um, you know, I find it hard sometimes with spouses um, to give that motivation um, because they, um, it almost comes off like pushing, pushing for exercise instead of motivating for exercise. When it's your spouse, it's a little bit different. So a lot of times the motivation comes from other people outside of your family. Um, that's why I love Rocksteady Boxing. Um, when you go there, you have a group of people that are all, they're all in the same boat. Um, and you give each other motivation going to the class. Um, so I definitely recommend classes as well to help with motivation. Um, you know, knowing that, oh, if I don't show up to my class today, what's everybody going to think? You know, so there's like a little bit of accountability there as well. Um, and exercise produces endorphins. So if you can just start, you just got to start to exercise. Um, those endorphins are going to make you feel good. And then you're going to seek out that feeling again. So um, those are just, you know, some examples. Um, every single patient that I have is motivated in a different way and by a different thing. So it's kind of hard to just give a really general statement about it, but hopefully that helped a little bit. Does anyone have any other questions? Um, I would say I have a question. Yes, sir. Hey, so um, you talked something about um, neuroplasticity. <clears throat> and my thing is, um, I'm actually just learning about Parkinson and stuff. And my question is, do you believe that surrounding a plan around neurogenesis? Because I came across that term that means that like new neurons can be formulated and stuff like that. So do you believe that working out, especially working out, I mean, it shows that it helps with everything, but by working out, um, eating right, and um, getting engaged with different programs and stuff like that, do you think that symptoms can be alleviated? Yes, I 100% I believe it because I see it all the time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, I'll just give an example. Um, you know, I had a younger, kind of younger, um, patient, I'll say younger. Um, mm -hmm. he, he was probably should have been retired, but wasn't was still working. And the Parkinson symptoms were really kind of spiking up a little bit. And he was really struggling at work and was like stumbling at work. And, um, you know, he didn't tell anybody at work that he had Parkinson's. Um, and then but he's never exercised. <laughs> ever. Mm -hmm. Um, so I worked with him and got him on an exercise program and, um, I worked with him over two months time period to get him up to the place he needed to be. Cause he had never mm -hmm. exercised before. So he needed a little bit of help to get to yeah. what he needed to do. And it totally changed his life. Um, mm -hmm. he was able to go to work. His symptoms were almost non-existent. Um, you know, people stopped asking him what was wrong with him um, mm -hmm. because he wasn't stumbling anymore. And I, I strongly believe it's because we made changes in his brain. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I would say like the more that I started understanding, because um, I studied gerontology at um, UNC Charlotte. And one thing okay. I started noticing that um, it's about how we look at the body and stuff like that. But yeah from a lot of things that I'm starting to understand that there are multiple um, stages that a person could be diagnosed in. So if you think that say five being the worst, do you believe that a person that's at a stage four due to the fact that they stick to a, like informal, informal, uh, informal, informal care support system, which um they actually have like family and stuff like that, helping them out and at the same time, having their like physical therapy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that symptoms could come back to a stage two due to what you just said? 
Uh, maybe not that far, maybe not that much better. Um, I'll just give another example. When I just I started working with a patient who does not take medicine for Parkinson's um, mm -hmm. um, because it just gave him orthostatic hypotension so significant that he wasn't able to take it. And um, just working with physical therapy, he was wheelchair bound mm -hmm. when I started with him. Mm -hmm. And now he walks around his house with a cane. Wow. So, you know, if you look at the stages yeah. of Parkinson's, we reversed that stage, that staging. Now he likely was probably at a stage two all along. He just didn't know the right things to do. Mm -hmm. And when you take somebody and you give them the right things to do, amazing things can happen. Um, but the earlier the intervention occurs, the, the better we are able to stop the progression um, we can definitely improve symptoms um, mm -hmm. in folks, but the goal is, is that if you're diagnosed in your stage one or stage two, when you get diagnosed is that you never get to the next stage. Yeah. You stay in that stage that you've been diagnosed in. Um, and neurologists are just starting <laughs> to catch on to that mm -hmm. um, and referring people for physical therapy and initial diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, even if the motor symptoms are very small, yeah. Um, and just giving us a chance to get them in an exercise program so the decline never happens. You know, a lot of times someone's yeah. not even referred to physical therapy until they get to stage three, you know, and we don't want that. We want, we want them early yeah. on so we can prevent the decline. Um, but okay. um, yeah, so, I mean, there's not like a ton of like, I would say, oops, sorry. There's not a ton of, I think, reversal that can happen. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, any, sometimes any improvement, you know, that takes the, that takes the pressure off of the caregiver, even, you mm -hmm. know, you got to think mm -hmm. about that, you know, like, um, usually if we're working with somebody elderly, their spouse is elderly mm -hmm. and if they require assistance to stand up, it's that spouse elderly spouse requiring that assistance for them. So if we can get them to stand up without assistance, that is huge progress. That's a huge quality of life issue um, that we look at and that we're trying to accomplish, even when people are in that advanced stage. Okay. Okay. And then yeah. so when it comes to like symptoms and stuff like that, do you think, um, do you believe that there are certain tests we because in my opinion, I feel like if we use technology in a different way, then mm -hmm. maybe we can catch certain like um, the onset of Parkinson and stuff like that. But do you feel like um, there's like a certain test that we can use that can like detect it? Like, Yeah, there's a couple different tests now that they use to detect Parkinson's. Um, but usually doctors are very hesitant to send people for this testing until the motor symptoms are pretty obvious. Um, what's interesting about Parkinson's and what you'll probably learn about is that there's a lot of warning signs about Parkinson's before mm -hmm. you get the motor symptoms. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're just starting to realize, you know, constipation is a big warning sign. People will lose their sense of smell. And of course, yeah. now in the world of COVID, people think, oh, I got COVID, I lost my sense of smell, but it's actually a symptom of Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all these really little things, I think that if people could put the pieces together and then get a test, um, you know, obviously they do some brain tests and they can tell, um, you know, if that part of the the brain is, is, is shrunk or not working well, they actually do skin biopsies now. So memory mm. movement in Charlotte, a skin biopsy. So if someone's not sure they have Parkinson's, they'll know after they get the skin biopsy because they can tell hundred percent if you have Parkinson's. Okay. Um, yeah, which is really helpful, but you know. Yeah, kind of it's like symptoms vary from person to person. Cause you, oh, so you can't truly tell greatly, until you greatly. do like different tests and stuff like that. So yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, they do. They, they, every single person that I touch has a different symptom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, it depends on the age too, you know? Yes, ma'am. So I'm going to say, do you believe that having a collaborate team? Um, so one yeah. thing in the um, health system, we try to move from a fragmented care into a collaborate care. So how can we bring multiple um, physicians like physical therapy, yeah. occupational yeah. therapy, speech therapists? How can we, do you believe that yeah. this could be the future for trying to reverse um, 
um, yeah. neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah, 100%. And that's what we are doing at Memory and Movement Charlotte. Um, and tomorrow, Dr. Iyer is also giving a presentation for, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, for the Parkinson's Association of the Carolinas. Um, and he is an amazing man that if you're super interested in this um, field, um, you need to get in touch with Memory and Movement Charlotte. They, we are trying to do what healthcare should be. So, um, you know, us, our therapy company, um, you know, because of laws and stuff, we partner with um, Memory and Movement, but Memory and Movement, they have social workers there, they have recreational therapists, they have counseling, they have therapists, all under one office. Mm-hmm. so that you don't have to go running around town yeah. um, to get whatever your needs are. Um, mm-hmm. and what we also did was we provide the in-home therapy as well. Mm-hmm. So um, the memory movement patients where it's a challenge to get to a clinic. Um, and of course, now it's a challenge to get appointments. We go straight to their house and we give them the therapy they need. So no excuses. We're there you know, Mm -hmm. and we're giving them their therapy and we're in the office. So, you know, I can just walk down the hallway. I can knock on Dr. Iris door and be like, Oh, Hey, I saw this patient and X, Y, Z. And, you know, he can, you know, you know, give me whatever advice he's going to give me about that patient. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it's really an amazing relationship and it should be the future of healthcare. Okay. Okay. Well, I appreciate you, Dr. Moore. Thank you. May mm-hmm. I ask you a question? Yes. I, I'm big on swimming when I was younger. Yeah. I really yeah. like to swim. But now when I get in the pool and try to swim, I no longer swim down the lane. I either sink or I swim to, I, I circle to the left. Mm-hmm. And my left side is what's affected most by the Parkinson's. Is that a reason why I'm doing that? And, and is there anything I can do to help that? Yeah, so... um I'm, I'm not the, I'm not the best person to talk about swimming, but, um, you know, I can give you my best answer. Um, Parkinson's usually does affect one side more than the other. Of course, as you advance with the stages, it does go to both sides, but, um, if you are weak on one side of your body and you're trying to do this bilateral, um, swim in a straight line, um, you might find it difficult to go into that straight line. Um, and the sinking is likely due to um, you probably are presenting with a little bit of bradykinesia. Um, so your strokes and your kicks are probably too slow. Um, so you would probably need to work with somebody who really knew swimming um, and could get in a pool with you and work on those things. Um, because I, I, I think everything is fixable. <laughs> That's the type of PT I am. <laughs> um, so I, I would say maybe try, I wish I knew somebody off the top. You know what? I actually do know somebody who might be able to help you. Um, do you see my email there on the screen? Yes. Shoot me an email. And I, are you able to get to Fort Mill? I, I can. Okay. Cause, um, uh, the, this girl I know does wellness. She does wellness stuff, but she does stuff in the pool and I'm thinking that she probably can help you. So I, I'll, I'll get you two in touch so that you can at least have a conversation. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Can I one, more all... question? one more question. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, Kathy, you mentioned lead time and uh, having trouble getting in to see doctors. Yeah. Um, I'm, I've been a uh, diagnosed a couple of years ago. I've been working with a very nice, uh, very good neurologist in uh, Norfolk. I lived in the Hatter, Seattle Banks. I'd like to get with the Center of Excellence for Parkinson's. And uh, I just spoke to the one in Richmond and uh, heard that was a good one uh, at VCU. And they said that the earliest they could get me would be next August. Is, is that typical? Are you hearing that type of thing? Or is that kind of exceptional? Um, well, in Charlotte, I'm hearing kind of six months. 
mm-hmm. is a wait list. It's a good wait list for the, for the people, um, for the neurologist in Charlotte, mm-hmm. um, memory movement, um, is at least a couple months before you can get in. Um, and I mean, you know, I can't say enough about Dr. Iyer, you know, being the best, um, mm-hmm. neurologist and movement, um, disorder specialist, um, in North Carolina. Um, but I know that's still, a, it's still a good ways for you to drive. Um, I'm just curious. Thank you. There is just not enough. There's not enough neurologists who are movement disorder specialists. There's not enough physical occupational and speech therapists that do Parkinson's. Um, there's just not enough of us for the amount of people being diagnosed with it. Um, so it's going to probably be a problem ongoing, but I would get on that wait list, but then maybe find, find, find somebody in the meantime who has a shorter wait list and um, just keep trying. Don't give up on trying to see somebody um, who you think is better um, than whoever you're seeing now. Uh, that's kind no. of a question. Uh, what would be, I've heard, I've been reading about the Senators of Excellence for Parkinson's, and I, I've had a lot of testing, I've had a lot of care. I wonder what I'd be getting other than just a second opinion. Yeah, that's the hard part. Um, you know, you're because you're so um uh you're you're so far away from any of those places, right? Where you know you're gonna drive hours and hours and taking into consideration what are what are they gonna do different? Mm-hmm. Um you know, I guess it depends on how um, happy or unhappy you are with your Parkinson's and maybe how much you want to participate in clinical trials, too, because I, I feel like the centers of excellence probably have more clinical trials going on um, or maybe have um, access to stuff before regular people have access to stuff. Um you know, where that might be the benefit. I mean, obviously if they have a year wait list, um, they're obviously very popular. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I I hate the wait list is so long. Yeah, I'm gonna see my neurologist in a a couple of weeks. So I'll ask her because she's, you know, she's supporting me and she says that uh, Mm -hmm. I should try try one. Yeah, Yeah. uh, and a lot can change in a year though. So your, your mission is to make sure that nothing changes in a year. (laughs) More walking, more exercise. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. Good luck. Uh, Someone put, someone put in the chat box. um, What about Dr. Bing Liu, L-I-U? I don't, I don't know who that doctor is, but I think maybe somebody wanted you to hear that name. I don't know. I don't know him though. So. Well, thank you for sharing with that. Um, Cause I think they sent maybe a private message. I didn't see that one. Oh, it was a, I, I'm sorry. It was a private message to me, but I shared. 